All right, today we're going to introduce one definition and then we're going to do some additional proofs for our system PL, which we'll call PL plus. Doesn't really matter, I'm going to accept it as part of the main system, but some people call it SD plus, SL plus, PL plus, uh, whatever you want. So we're going to talk about a theorem first. And a theorem is any formula that is a tautology. And if you remember, a tautology is a formula that's always true. So no matter what inputs you give it for its truth values, it's always going to come out true. And we can, we can prove any theorem from an empty set of assumptions. So normally we say that a set of sentences proves some formula alpha, but in the case of a theorem, we don't need anything to prove the theorem. This is just a turnstile alpha. Uh, some people will write a null set here. This is the exact same thing. Uh, totally not necessary, but that is a theorem. And you can input theorems wherever you want into proofs. That is totally okay because it's always true. There's never going to be a, a proof where it's going to be false. So you are completely free to put a theorem at any line in the proof, just write theorem introduction and you're all good. So we're going to prove that A arrow A or B is a tautology, or you can also say we're going to prove it's a theorem, same thing. So what we do is we don't have any premises. We have to assume the antecedent as a supposition. So we always take the antecedent as a supposition and then we want to prove uh, the consequent. So on line two, really what we do is we just do or introduction. So we're going to get A or B. And this is from line one with an or introduction. And now I made this a little bit too long. We can just write A arrow A or B, since this is a conditional proof from lines one and two. This should be lines one, two, two. And the interesting thing you see here is that there is no line beside our theorem. And this is how you know it's a theorem, because you write it without the line, because a supposition opens up a new line that you eventually have to close. What some people will do is they'll always just have a second line open. So some people might have a proof like this, and this would be your end theorem. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I don't like the line because I like to know that I'm dealing with theorems. So that is how you prove a theorem. All right. Page two. Let's do some new rules. Modus tollens. Just like modus ponens, if you remember that in modus ponens you have A arrow B, A gives you B. Well, this is kind of the same thing. If we have A arrow B and we have not B, then we can conclude not A. So basically, modus ponens means confirming the antecedent, and modus tollens means denying the consequent. So if we say A arrow B, but B doesn't occur, then A can't occur. And this actually corresponds with the truth tables here. So if we have A arrow B, and if we give A as ones and zeros, and b's ones and zeros and here's the truth table it's false when a is true and b is false when we take a look at the line where b is false let's take a look at the lines where b is false it's these two lines there's only going to be one line where the truth is preserved and that is going to be the bottom line which states that if b is going to be false then a must also be false otherwise the conditional is going to be false, and we don't want that. So modus tollens is a proof of this truth table. So this is modus tollens, just like the other ones. If you have line i and j, then you just write i, j, m, t. I won't write these out because they're kind of obvious what the lines are, and we'll get to that when we prove soundness and completeness anyway, so uh, we'll wait till then. Hypothetical syllogism is another proof, and this is fairly intuitive. In fact, we've kind of done this already. If we have A arrow B and B arrow C, then we can prove A arrow C. It's just a chain. 
So you kind of just go along the chain. Oh, if we have A, then we have B there, which means that if we have B there, then we have C. So it kind of crosses out the middleman and just kind of forgets about it and puts a big arrow down. Uh, with hypothetical syllogism, you're really only allowed to skip one middleman. So if you have A arrow, B arrow, C, this is kind of like the condensed version, putting the two together. You're not allowed to do this and then claim A arrow D. No, if, if you had a similar proof, let's say A arrow B, B arrow C, that's a terrible D, C arrow D, you'd have to claim A arrow C first, and then you could go A arrow D. Um, this is a technical thing, and it's not, I don't really care if you were to produce proofs for me that use this like this, because I think it's obvious, but uh, some people are really anal about their philosophical logic, which you, you'll see why eventually, but uh, for the sake of this, it really doesn't matter. That's hypothetical syllogism. A couple more, disjunctive syllogism. I have used this once already, I believe. And if we have A or B, and we have not A, then we get B because this states that one of the disjuncts must be true. Therefore, if we know one of them is false, then the other one must be true. Similarly, we can have A or B, and not B claims A. So, we know that one of them has to be true, we know that one of them isn't true, therefore the other one must be true. This is, uh, I would say, fairly intuitive. And we do have another one here. This is a very special rule, and... I'm going to tell you why after I show it. If you have P, then you have not not P. And if you have not not P, you have P. This is intuitive, because if I say I am not not hungry, that means I am hungry. And from this, what we're going to say is that you can do this rule anywhere in a formula. Anywhere in a formula. So, normally, you can't do rules on just subparts of proofs. That is not okay. If you have A and B and C, you can't just take A out of there. You have to separate A and B. You have to separate it so it goes into A and B and then C, and then you can separate A and B. But in this scenario, if we have not not A and B and C, it is perfectly acceptable to rewrite this as A and B and C. Because this is the only rule in our system that I'm going to give you where we're allowed just to eliminate double negations or add double negations wherever we want. So we could also take this one and rewrite this as A and B and not not C if we want it. That's perfectly acceptable. So. This is a very intuitive rule and something that you've probably already seen in proofs or have used in proofs without even knowing that it's a rule because it's just so intuitive. In axiomatic systems, you'd have to prove this rule. It's a really terrible proof that is very long and it sucks, but we're not using an axiomatic system, so be happy. Uh, a few more rules. These are... These are also rules you can use anywhere in a proof, it doesn't matter. You can use uh, just like negation anytime you want, anywhere you want. And I'm not going to spend too much time on these rules because in mathematics they're somewhat important, but in this sort of logic uh, it's not important at all. Commutation. If we have alpha and beta, then we also have beta and alpha, or B and A. So we just switch the positions. In fact, I'm not going to use that arrow because it's confusing. I'm going to use the logical equivalence arrow. Associativity, if we have a bracket around A and B and C, then this is the same thing as having a bracket around just B and C. And I should mention, uh, for all of these, this works with and as well as or. So either or. I'm just going to write them with all with and, but you can do the same thing with or. Um, item potence. If you have A and A, 
this is the same thing as just having a. You can prove these all with uh, truth tables if you want to, but I would say they're fairly intuitive. And distribution. Uh, this is sort of like algebra. So you might remember that if you have um, a plus b times the number c, this is the same thing as saying a times c plus a times b, or sorry, b times c. So this is the same thing with logic. So if we have p or q and r, this is the same thing as saying p and r or q and r. And again, if you flip the and or or signs, it's going to be the same thing. So if we have uh, p and q or r, this would be p or r and q or r. And these are equivalent. Uh, it might make sense because if we say we have p or q and r, that means r is going to be true. And either p is going to be true or q is going to be true. So either we're going to have a collection of p and r or we're going to have the collection of q and r. We might have p and q and r, but that condition is satisfied by this formula anyway, so we don't need to include it. Uh, similarly with the bottom one, same reasoning. So I know these are a lot of rules, and I believe this is the last one I give you. Yeah, it's the last one I give you. Uh, this is De Morgan's Law. This is very important. Probably the number one lifesaver in any discrete mathematics, propositional logic, predicate logic, modal logic, uh, any static statistics. It's huge. Uh, this is a very famous rule. And in set theory too, it's the exact same thing. Um, if we have not A or B, this is the same thing as not A and not B. Similarly, if we have not A and B, it's the same thing as saying not A or not B. So what this is saying is that A or B is false. And what are the conditions when A or B is false? Well, let's take a look at this truth table. 1100, And we know it's only false when both of them are false. So what we're doing is we're making a formula that's equivalent to this table. And that's going to be that one. Similarly, when we have A and B, and we have our truth table, 1010. Zero, one, zero. I really don't like how this does it at the bottom of the screen. Uh, they are both only true when, or they are, it's only true when both of them are true. So we're going to make a formula that corresponds to this line, which, if you'll see here, this is not A or not B. And this would be the same as, I will prove just this one for you, not A or not B. Uh, this would be 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, because the signs flip. And if we take a look at this truth table, what we get is we get 0, 0, 0, 1. And this is the same line, even though it's in the opposite order as this one right here. So it's an equivalent relationship. And this is a very important rule, so please, please remember these. Just because they're so important, I made a question with this rule that we're going to do, like, in a couple minutes. It's not this one, it's going to be the next one. So, let's do a proof. We want to prove P or not P from these set of premises. Now, uh, of course, you can just write P or not P anytime you want from theorem introduction because we know that this is always going to be true so we're not going to do that because that's cheating instead let's use only the rules we've done today excluding theorem introduction so let's see what we got we have oh it looks like we have some nice hypothetical syllogism here so we have not p arrow not s from the first two lines and we have not p arrow not s and then we have not s arrow not p. Therefore, from line 5, we have not p arrow not p. 
and this is from lines three and four with hypothetical syllogism. And now, what are we going to do here about P or not P? What is this? Well, if you remember the definition that I gave for the arrow, we're going to have not not P or not P. Since if you remember, A arrow B is the same thing as saying not A or B. And from this, so this would be five and a definition. Then in line seven, I said we can use a double negation whenever we want. So we are simply going to negate that. So we're going to get P or not P. And this will be from six, double negation. So here's a proof from this set of premises that you can get P or not P. Now, of course, you don't need any of these premises to prove P or not P because this is a tautology and you can introduce tautologies whenever you want. You don't even have to question it. You can be like, hey, is P or P not P true? And you're going to be like, yeah, P or not P is true. It's always true. You're going to be like, well, what about that time it's not true? And you're going to say, well, it's never not true. It's always true. Something is either true or not true. In fact, if I say something is either true or not true, that's a sentence that you believe is always true, so it makes sense. Okay, enough of my rambling. Let's get on to the De Morgan question. F, arrow not, not B, and not C, and then we have not B or C. So we need to prove not F or B. I made this really hard. This was the only one I actually made up on my own. The rest I collected from other books. And I figured, hey, we need a good De Morgan's question, and this book does not give me anything good. So, here we go. First of all, let's De Morgan a bad boy out. I think you should always De Morgan the bad boys out, because it's, uh, it's helpful to have them out. That's all there is to it. Especially because when we do De Morgan's, we're going to get not B and not C. So what you do with De Morgan's is you push the negation... In each in front of each of the terms and then you switch the sign of the and or or so that's how you do it so this is line two with the Morgans and now what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna put brackets around this to make this easier to see we had a rule called modus tollens and modus tollens said that if we have a arrow B and not B we can get not A. Well, this is sort of the same thing, except we're kind of modifying this rule a little bit. We're saying A arrow not B, given B, we're going to get not A. Now, how I want you to think about this is just sneaking in that double negation right there. Yeah, that's all we're doing, we're just sneaking in a double negation there. And what we're saying is, well, not B is false. That's what we're saying. Therefore, A must be false. And that's the trick we're doing here. So from that, we are going to get the negation of the antecedent here, which would be not F. And what you might be thinking is, well, we want not F or B, but we have a not B here. So you might be a little confused, but remember, we have that rule that everybody forgets about at some point in their career or introduction that you can just do whenever you want and it's still going to be true so there you go you've proven not f or b this is all the proof practice i'm going to do with these rules and i'm not 100 percent sure what's next i think we're going to start some good old mathematical induction or something like that and get on to the meat of the system this is the proofs and now we have to prove that the system works and that the system is true since so far you might believe oh yeah the semantics truth tables the proof system is all true but i haven't shown you yet that they actually are true are they connected you don't know if they're connected or not but we're going to get to that and if you're in a more advanced logic course you're going to be looking at this stuff if you're in an intro to reasoning and logic course uh the stuff you're going to see in the next few videos are probably things that you're not going to do in class and I encourage you to look at them because they're very cool.